I was 19, broke, unemployed, and sold my girlfriend's canopy for drug money. So, I thought I'd better sew her a new one. What a sentence, and what a story. This describes the humble yet outrageous beginnings of NZ Aerosports, the home of Icarus Canopies, in the words of our founder himself. From getting a paratrooper toy from his mom, watching parachutes at the DZ as a six-year-old, jumping off the wharf with a parachute made from bedsheets, doing his first jump at 16, sewing his first canopy on a borrowed machine at 19, and starting to sell parachutes out of a garage in 1986, Paul Gyro Martin had an undying love for the sky. Our company started with one man with the wildest of spirits in a true blue sky dream, a renegade. In the time that Gyro created and ran the Icarus Canopies brand until he passed away in 2017, he pushed everything he had to its limits. We miss him and we always will. Gyro is the next generation of NZ Aerosports. It honors our founder, of course, because it was the name we all knew him by, but Gyro the rebrand also marks the start of a new chapter, our next jump. Gyro is the space between sound and silence, art and science, chaos and calm. Gyro is a state of epic tranquility that transcends understanding. That moment, in the door, in free fall, mid-swoop, where nothing but the present exists. A perfect balance of euphoria and thrill. Gyro captures our passion for flying and our commitment to designing break-the-fucking-rules canopies that deliver pilots pure, wild flight. Coming straight from the cockpit, it's another episode of Lunatic Fringe with the fucking pilot. Ready, set, go! Back in the can for another edition of Lunatic Fringe Into the Void and a long-awaited podcast for me. Straight into it, man. Who the fuck are you and what do you do? Yeah, I'm Jeff Provenzano. I jump out of planes. You do jump out of planes, man. You do as well. And I am so happy to see you on the other side of this screen. So I know it's uh, it's only early afternoon for you, but it's late for me. So cheers. Cheers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Great seeing you. So yeah. look, a lot of people that are listening know exactly who they are. They follow your escapades and all the amazing stuff that you're putting out and, and uh, all the stuff that you've done for a long, long time now. Uh, but I like to get the backstory. I want to know how it all began and and uh, kind of your path to where you are now. So how did you get started in really anything extreme, not just necessarily jumping? Yeah, I think it's always just been in my nature. You know, as a little kid, I drove my parents crazy. You know, my dad told me one time that he would catch me like no matter what, where I jumped from. And he came home one day and I was standing on the roof. It was only one floor, but, you know, I mean, it wasn't like a you know multiple floor building or anything but i was like he's i'm like hey you ready to catch me you know he was like no no go climb back in the window go back into the house and uh i don't remember that actually i just i just hear them tell me the story of that all the time but yeah i think it's just kind of in my blood a little bit of a you know a little bit of an adventurist and uh is it a family thing like our, our mom and dad uh, adventurous oh, types eh, definitely not mom and dad maybe you know my grandfather from my mom's side uh he was a bit of you know he was into adventurous stuff like he you know raced motorcycles rode horses and that was kind of the extent of it in general but um yeah my parents are both not extreme you know my dad like he's athletic he was into sports as a kid you know soccer golf um for most of his life also like really good golfer too and my mom's an artist she paints you know so well that might yeah. uh, explain some of the creativity and some of the stunts that you're doing definitely uh you know i went to art school and i always tell people you know like oh you still do art i'm like totally i live a very creative lifestyle which is yeah it's absolutely <laughs> true i mean I, I, the one that stood out for me in relatively recent past was you swooping the cranberry ponds uh, yeah and all i could think is who the fuck comes up with that but it was so badass well you know it's like very few ideas are really originally your own you know it's like you see something from somewhere and you adopt it and like tweak it and i saw another red bull athlete his name is brian grubbs he he's a wake boarder wake skater like foil guy like just waterman like badass waterman all around um and he did a wake project that you know they just set up some 
some pulleys across that thing and he was ripping across the pond. This is probably like 10 years ago. And I just, it's just always stuck in my head. And I just was driving one day, I was driving to the wind tunnel and I just was thinking about it. And I was like, I'm just going to give Brian a call and just be like, yo, dude, where did you do that? Like, give me the skinny. Who is it? And he was like, oh, dude, Farmer Steve, I'll connect you. He's the man. And literally, like, I was talking to Farmer Steve like an hour later and he's like, yeah, let's do it. He's like, totally work, willing to, like, you know, work with you, have you come out and do this. And he schooled me on the whole, you know, the season of it and when and how and what and all the details. And we, we basically, yeah, we made it happen like later that year, but the idea came from a wakeboard video. I saw of Brian just like ripping these things across cranberries. And it just, it's like, man, I want to swoop that one day. It was cool as shit, man. I mean, the, the shit that you have to learn about in your sport of skydiving, because I want to say I'm in the same sport as you, <laughs> but it's definitely different levels. <laughs> I mean, probably like on a skill wise, you know, we're doing very much a similar thing. Um, I do have incredible like opportunities to do things a little bit outside of the box. Sure. You know, and a lot of that is just, yeah, it's been from, you know, being with Red Bull for all these years and just kind of tying into just doing projects and these like one off unique things. Sure. It, it it's kind of turned itself into like a full-time thing like okay yeah. what else, like weird thing weird place what else can i do where else can i go sure and it's kind of created that but um i feel i feel that you know it's i'm doing the same thing as we're all doing at the drop zone and a lot of times i just get to do it in very unique places sure Sure. Now, speaking of uh, uh, drop zones, where did you get started and how did you get started? Like, where did the idea come to make that first jump? Point break, 1991. I was like, yes, I, can't I was like 12, I don't know, 13, something like that. Saw point break, you know, and was just like, whoa, just all things cool about that and wanted yeah. to do it. You know, just a 13 year old mind. I was like skateboarding and doing all that stuff at that age. So I was just like, ah, we got to jump out of a plane. And me and my buddies, like my group of friends, we talked about it over the years, like throughout high school, we would talk about it. And, you know, this is before internet, before like you saw images of skydiving everywhere. Right. You know, it's like point break and maybe a couple movies, maybe once in a while you'd see it on a commercial, you know, on regular like TV, not yeah. streaming or anything like that. And uh, right. yeah, I mean, that just planted the seed that really did. And we kept talking about it year after year. It would just kind of come up. And when we all turned 18, we're like, it's time. Let's do it. Right. And so, you know, I was, I lived in New York. I was born and raised in New York, just outside New York city in, in Westchester County. And not far from us was skydive the ranch mm. in, in upstate in New Paltz. So a little bit farther north than from where I'm from. And, um, you know, we found it in the yellow pages and it just kind of went up there. You know, I didn't really think anything more like past that day at the time. I was like, we're going to do this. Sure. Like one time check, you know, like check the box off. Right. Right. Now so, I got to ask you being a, I'm a point break guy myself. Same thing. It was point break in the right. movie drop zone of the two that hooked me. Um, yes. Point break, the original or the remake. Oh, the original. Thank I you. Mean, I will. The stunts in the remake are pretty cool. The st it kind of got lost in the whole quality of the movie and the yeah. story though. Yeah. But the stunts were definitely hands down amazing, especially all the aerial stunts that, you know, some of my teammates did. Sure. Uh, they were super rad, you know? Uh, but yeah, the storyline on the remake was just the character. Right. It was a little cheesy. I was like, ah, you guys. Yeah, they, they lost the plot, man. That first one had me by the balls. And the only saving grace to the second one is like you, I knew a few of the crew that were doing some of the jumps. So, I mean, props to the stunts were fucking epic. But yeah, I, I think they should have taken more of like the Top Gun approach to the sequel. You know, yeah. like Tony Keanu. Yeah, he's older. Maybe he's like, you know, the chief now. And, you know, there's another young guy coming up and right. he's getting pulled you know, like maybe go like Top Gun Maverick sure. direction, not like, oh, we're going to kind of just like re kind of redo it and try to like, because they tried plugging in like some cheesy lines from the 
from the original one and i was like oh no that just that just didn't work why yeah. did you have to like repeat that line like can't repeat that line like yeah. sure i think most skydivers that uh, are like you and me that got hooked by that movie feel exactly the same way <laughs> it was just a yeah that was oh. a big, big population of us man i mean yes. that was like there was an influx of tandems after that movie came out you know oh I absolutely remember, absolutely yeah. so you go out and you make your first jump at the ranch did you land and were you like fuck yes this is for me or was it just and eh, that was cool no i was i was i was blown away <laughs> my tandem instructor uh he was steve webb steve utah he was like he was on a backup load he was like hey don't go anywhere i'll be right back i gotta do another tandem i was like cool so he pretty much like you know ran off from the landing area and i'm just like I need a minute. And, and I, I went for this walk. Like I just disappeared. Nobody knew where I went. Like, where was it? And I went for like 20, 30 minute walk. Cause he was back down on the ground already from his next jump. And I came walking in and I walked straight up to the school and I was like, I got one question. Like what, what's next? You know? And they're like, Oh, you're AFF. Blah, 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 blah. I'm like, okay. you know, I'm like, how much is that? And they're like 200 bucks or whatever it was. And Okay, I got to deliver, you know, X amount of pizzas. Like, cool, sign me up for two weeks. You know, I'll be back in two weeks. And um, I knew, I knew at that point, this was something that I, I was going to do more of. Sure. I never, I still hadn't thought like I, you know, make, turned it into what it is now. Or, or even, I remember looking at that log book and it was like that student log book. It has like enough pages for like a hundred jumps. And I remember looking at that being like, yeah, I might not even fill this thing up, you know, sure. like, but I knew I had to do more jumps at that point. Now, what I, was, I, uh, I, what was the plan for life before that first jump? Yeah, I was in art. I was going to art school in New York city and it was really just the dream of, you know, getting that job in New York, creating art and just like living that like romantic, like artist life of New York city poor and, you know, just chasing <laughs> dreams and, you know, whatever. Yeah, that was definitely more of the lines and, and just continuing to pursue skateboarding and snowboarding at that time in my life. You know, I was skating a lot. I was, I shop sponsor, I had some, a shop sponsorship you know, I was getting like free decks. I mean, I can go out, break my skateboard, go to the skate shop and they slap a new deck on there. And sure. Have fun, man. You know, so it was like, it was, it was, it was just fun, free stuff that I was getting shoes and t-shirts sure. and stuff. Well, I mean, I guess the, the, um, stepping away from the, uh, uh, the poor artist in New York style to become the poor skydiver traveling the world was a pretty good swap. I was like, yeah, it was even like, well, it was like probably like swapping it out for a poorer lifestyle, uh, because there wasn't a lot of ends, you know, ways to make money on the drop zone sure. and i think the first year that i i graduated school fast forward a little bit i graduated school i had pur pursued skydiving as much as i could during those summer times of, of of college sure and then i'm like cool i'm gonna move to skydive arizona i graduated i'm gonna move there for like a year you know take like a year off i'll come back to new york soon don't worry get that art job don't worry mom and dad like <laughs> and um yeah, I, I mean, it takes over, doesn't it? <laughs> it? It really does. I, it did. It just it 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 did take over. But anyway, back to my original thing was was just that I wanted to say like that first year I moved there, I, I, I packed parachutes. I think I made nineteen thousand dollars. Like, how did I live on that and jump? And I don't know. Right. I no idea. Number sticks in my head. It might have been a little more. I don't know. But the number nineteen thousand dollars. I remember when I did my taxes the very first time in my life. I had to do taxes, and I remember that number. And it was like, man, how do you live off of that? Right. <laughs> right. So I mean that that begs the question. The jumps were ten bucks. They were ten dollar jumps. You got a discount if you're a full time staff. I had a free, free living basically. Like you sure. park a trailer for free. So, yeah, I was like, it was a lot less expenses too, a lot less overhead. Well, and you're a kid at the time, right? So you can justify 19 grand and living in a trailer on the drop zone a hell of a lot more than you could if you're still doing that in your 30s. <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> definitely. Um, you know. 
So yeah. you, you you're packing parachutes. You made nineteen thousand dollars. You're wondering how the fuck do I survive on this? Where did the transition come into? Where did you go from that to this? I mean, where did you shift gears and and it kind of became its own thing? Um, I think it just slowly evolved. It was just kind of like this slow process because at that time it didn't feel like anything would it, it was moving fast enough. You know, I had the dreams and. You know, wanted to jump more. The dream was just to jump more, right? You hear sure. the plane going up and down all day long. And my dream was just like, I need to, I want to be in that. I need yep. to be in that. I didn't care about the competitions or the pro or like all these things that are going on. I just needed to be in that plane. Sure. You know? So that was that was uh that was that was the main goal. But the whole transition from that to this, I mean, it was like this long process. A lot of steps in between. Like I said, it just felt like it was never changing at some points, you know. It just felt <laughs> in some ways like I was in that trailer forever, you know. Sure. And, uh, but it, it the 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 cliff notes was like packer, pack more, <laughs> <laughs> uh, jump, uh, uh, tandem videos, coaching, and then like kind of mixed in there too. It was like starting to, like dabble with free fly competitions and that sort of thing. But free flight competitions were being on a free flight team. We all know on a team is tough. Yeah. You know, scheduling logistics of being on a team is tough and you, you just need more support, right? You need a lot more support. You need, you need to train. You need a jump totally dedicated with your team to go train that thing. And right around that time I was playing with that, but it wasn't, you know, I wasn't winning anything. I didn't have the support, you know, we weren't on the, the teams and all that. But right around that same time, I was doing tandem videos and coaching. So I was like being paid to, and, and being paid to be in the air. And what do you do every time when you jump, you land? So he's like, oh, I'm practicing swooping. And I'm like excelling in that really. Because I was like, I was always looking like most tandem video guys to this day. They love that swoop. They love their landing, you know, because that, that moment is theirs. So, you know, they sure. do this jump, they film, they don't check. Now they're just doing their thing, you know. And so right around that time, swoop competitions started to evolve, like the modern day, like swoop competition. Sure. And I was like, oh, I can do that. Like I'm training all the time for that. So that was the transition from like, kind of like the pack and map, so to say, to like athlete type stuff. Now, would this be when like the, the PST tour was still going or the, yes. okay. Tour, exactly. All right. Cool. Then I tour, pro swoop tour, um, the Red Bull tour, the European swoop tour, you know, there was, it evolved. Like not that first year it was just pro swoop tour, but you know, soon after it just evolved into like, there was three tours going on and you know, they all were scattered around Europe and America for the most part. And yeah, I mean, you stayed busy all of a yeah. sudden I'm like going to you're going to, you know, 20, 30 competitions a year. And then during the busy months, you're basically like, I was, I remember one summer just being in Europe for a comp, back in the States for a comp, back in Europe for a comp, back in the States for a comp. Like, you know, and then you're like bouncing around the States for like three weeks and you go back to Europe for a comp. Sure. Yes. Well, that would have been most likely when uh, our paths uh, crossed because uh, I was out at Cross Keys when the PST tour would come through Wildwood. So if you ever did Wildwood, yeah. we I did. Yes. So our our paths I probably sit on the beach on a landing there. Oh, I what is a... one of the uh, one of the gates? My lines and I just like it was like the first gate too. I like flipped it, but, like soft sand everything. I just I just like it wasn't even like horrific looking. I have it on video. It was just like I clipped it and I just came to a stop and stood up. <laughs> it was like the weirdest thing ever. And I was like, well, what just happened? Saw some cool like, shit. Yeah. Saw yeah, some cool like, shit and some great wipeouts in, in uh, uh, Wildwood. I saw at least two guys snag a, a seagull in the lines going across that pond. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And then one of the judges got snagged in the zone accuracy by some lines and it flipped her, I remember. Yeah. And it, yeah, that was like, oh man. But yeah, JC hit a bird. Yes. JC Pope Play should hit a bird at Wildwood. I'll never forget that. Well, and he towed him First through the whole, towed, towed that bird through the entire course. It like got tangled, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah man. Right. Yeah, yeah. 
I'll never forget that. Well, and, and I was uh, yeah. I was doing tandems at Wildwood, so I was um, you know rolling out of the helicopter um, when John would fly the Alouette and land on the beach there. And what a fucking place to jump because you're in between a roller coaster and a Ferris wheel and the boardwalk, and it was just I mean what an epic spot. Yeah, and I think that that was kind of the beginning of like, wouldn't it be cool if I could, you could just go and just swoop all over the world into different places did i not just that idea i think i just saw a video of you randomly it's just you there's no crowd swooping into a canal and just kind of doing a head dive into the water next to nobody or was that you or because i've seen so many videos you going in between boats and you and canals and and you and and, uh, the cranberries and Yes. Oh, I know which one you're talking about. Yeah, I just did. I think I, I threw, um, was it like not a canal, but like a row of boats? Yeah. Maybe. I think I just posted that. Like it, that was, um, that happened a few years ago, but I recently, I just recently posted a, a version of it. Of oh, fair enough. So, so yeah, it was in Croatia. Yeah, that was cool. When you started doing the 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 swooping and everything, and and then you're competing and you're traveling all around the world, is something like Red Bull even on the radar at that point, or did did Red Bull kind of come out of the blue, or did you pursue it? Um. Well, no. They, you know, I was kind of in the right time at the right place, early early days of Red Bull. You know, there was very few Red Bull athletes across all sports. Um, but I was living up in Lake Tahoe and yeah, I mean, Shane McConkey was based up there Yeah, and he was the first North American rebel athlete. And so, you know, rebel had a big presence in Tahoe at that time. They were like, was this Wes, this was Wes's drop zone? No. So it was before that it was in, it was before Wes had a drop zone in Tahoe. It was, uh, in North Lake Tahoe. It was North of Truckee. Oh it yeah. yeah. Called, a, but it was Charles Bryan and Mike Vale. That's right. You know, a couple of, like, uh, you know, the OG godfathers of, of the sport of like, Hell yeah. modern. Skydiving. And they had this sick little drop zone. We didn't even have a creeper on it. There was no RW there. It was free fly only. You know, the only belly jumps you did was AFF. And then like your first jump was like, you get, would, would take you out head down, you know, like your graduation jump, you know, awesome. if you're a good student, you'd probably take you out head down on your level eight or whatever it was, you know, <laughs> if you were like one of those really like, this guy's blazing through AFF, he did two levels in one jump, you know, it's like, oh yeah, you, we're going to take you head down on the last jump. So yeah, it was a cool <laughs> free only drop zone up there in, in Tahoe and yeah, Rebel was just around. And then, you know, there was a guy, Frank Gambali. He was a base jumper. Yeah, I met Frank. He was, he was jumping with Red Bull parachutes. And it just slow. He brought in Mike and Charles. And Charles and Mike started to, like, jump into, like, Red Bull parties in Tahoe with Red Bull parachutes. Um, you know, not, not a real structured program at that time by any means. It was very you know, bandit style. I don't even know if those guys were getting permit permissions to do any of that stuff at that time. <laughs> you know, I was like, Can you jump, this yeah. jump in. And then they slowly brought in like John DeVore and then, you know, it kind of grew. It started to become more of a team. And this is like maybe 2000 ish, 2001, two. And um, I saw it on the radar and I saw it was a thing to do. And I didn't really think of, anything of the time and 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 even when i first got off so i was in with the whole with the whole family of red bull at that time mm. and and at some point i want to say like oh five ish oh six maybe oh five oh six somebody they asked me they're like hey you want to be part of rebel and that was the peak of swoop comps days right like right it was more comps than you can count on your hands and toes and whatever and I was like, I told, you know, I remember like, oh, you want to do this? And I was like, nah, I can't, I'm too busy. <laughs> like, because it just wasn't what it was still, but it is now like, nah, because I was really like, all I wanted to do is compete. And they were like, yo, that's totally cool. Give us a call when you're ready. And I didn't really think much of it. I, I just was like, yeah, no, I'm, I'm good. And then a few years later, I, I remember I was burnt out on the swoop comps. Now I remember sitting on, on a plane or a helicopter actually in Russia. I remember just being like, I don't want to be here. I'm done. 
I'm over <laughs> this. Like, I do not want to be in this like emotional roller coaster of winning and losing. And I'm only happy if I win now. And like half the time you can't win every time. So you're not going to be happy. All like, I was like, I'm no, I'm over this. I'm, like went home, called rebel. I'm like, Hey, is that offer still up? Can I do it. Like, let's do this. And they're like, yeah, well, we're in the middle of the year, but yeah, we'll start, you know, we'll get you on and start using you. And we'll get you on next year. So that's awesome. That, I mean, so it was a two year gap between when I first was offered a position with them. And then when I officially was like, let's do this was like 2008, I think. Nice. Was the official like, yo, let's go. Well, and of course, <laughs> anybody listening now is like, he fucking said no to Red Bull. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah, I said no to Red Bull, man. It just went, yeah, yeah. But we didn't, before social media still, before all of that, you know, sure. so... Um, now with, with Red Bull, I, I, I've talked to a couple of Red Bull athletes and asked them kind of how Red Bull works. And, and, uh, uh, I'm sure your, um, experience is, is quite similar, but are they guiding you towards uh, specific stunts that they want to see, or is it just, uh, you're coming up with ideas and sending them the plans? Uh, when it comes to stunts, we're, we're the ones coming up with the ideas of the stunts. Uh, you know, the things that they will come at us and be like, can you, you know, can you jump into this event? Can you land here? Can you, you know, do something at this? What can we do into this event? You know, and they'll come up to us sometimes from that kind of uh, angle. Sure. But usually when it's something very like stunt oriented or, you know, just athlete project based, I mean, that the athlete projects come from the athletes. Sure. Sure. Well, I just saw one that was, hey, we're the experts. They're not, of course. They're, you know, they're, and they, they'd say that they're like, you guys are experts. We're not, you know, well, like, I love that. they. I, I love that they mix so many of the sports too, because like one of the ones that you recently um, posted was the helicopter going inverted, hucking a base jumper off to a swooper with a plane carving around it all filmed. I'm assuming with um, uh, uh, whatchamacallit. Um, a drone. And yeah, a drone. And it was so obviously well scripted and planned out and fucking epic i mean you're just all over the place going holy shit where is this going next that it drew yeah. you in to want to watch it from start to finish because you're like i have no idea what happens next yeah yeah no it was, that was super it was so, fun was I, super fun project to work on um I fly drones. I have like little you know FPV setups and I got into FPV flying and I just, you know, so I was always watching the videos. I'm like, you know, geeking out online, seeing all these like really good FPV guys. And I hadn't really met anybody in that community up until that point when started to meet some, some really good drone pilots. And like right around that time too, the one shot, like the one shot idea was kind of like a thing right? These like long elaborate, you know, one minute. Fit. And it was when, when, when you were capped at one minute still on Instagram or whatever, like that was your time limit of a video of a post. Sure. So you're we like, okay. So I had that idea, like, well, we, we need to do something that's just kind of like bang, 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 all these, like, you know, one thing after another, after another. And yeah, that was, you know, the idea came pretty easy. The hardest part was actually convincing Aaron, the helicopter pilot, like, no, man, we're just gonna have a drone like flying around your rotors and it's gonna be cool. Don't worry, he's not gonna like, I mean, if he hits the rotors, like, yeah, you're probably, you know, that's not a good day, but like, don't worry, I'm sure it'll be fine. <laughs> and he wasn't too into that, you know? So, so we found ways, you know, eventually we figured out a way, you know, we got all together, we had like everybody, involved in that really like coming together and then working out all the details of like how we can create a sequence and it started with like okay it'll start with the helicopter because like the drone can easily track him find him and then just trail him from a very safe distance so that was like okay aaron felt a little warm and fuzzy he's like all right cool yeah all right we'll do that one so it starts with the roll loop popping off the skids during the barrel roll. And then, and then Aaron's gone. And then he's like, he's safe. No <laughs> drone crashed in his road. Like, you know, and um, 
and you know, and that that was uh that was the hardest part was convincing sure. the helicopter. Pilot. But, well, you know, I know you've done cool. you've done a lot of stuff that involved drones shadowing you. Does does it make you nervous having a drone zipping around you? Because I mean, you're moving. No, I think. Well, yeah, I mean, it is a good question, and it's it's super. You know, you should be, you should be. Um, but just like you put trust in your teammates, you know, if you're following your teammate and you're not really focusing like where you are, you're, you're just like focusing on the tail of his wing or you know, his wings, whatever, you know? So you're putting a lot of trust into someone to like, we're going to land right where we need to land, or we're going to, you know, fly wingsuits and open right where we need to open because we're over downtown, wherever, you know, you put that trust into the person who's doing that job and just, and that's just part of the, you know, having a good team. And that's why that, that one shot worked was like, you know, just the all-star roster of people, including the drone pilot, which I had been flying with. We had done some stuff in California. He's, you know, learning me, you know, learning landings and just learning how to follow and not just follow, how to find you in the sky was like the first thing. It's like, all right, never found a parachute. So just like figuring out safe ways to get to me without like all the other, you know, yeah. crashing into anyone else or any of that stuff. Just, just like working out a lot of the details with him and, and then doing more at, at, in Arizona with him. And, you know, through that process, learning all the rules of drones and, you know, waivers and, you know, all that stuff, like the legalities of it, which, you know, you just, it's just paperwork, just like setting up a, a demo, but you just got to sure. apply for permits and things like that. Um, and, you know, kind of like learning that stuff in the process. And then just while we were flying and practicing together, I was building confidence in, in, in that drone pilot. Sure. So I've worked with two main, actually three, three guys, but two of them, they kind of work in tandem. So they're like a team and then another dude, um, that I work with. So yeah, this guy, Sammy FPV, I got Nico FPV and then Ewan, who's, uh, Ewan, Ewan, who is, uh, kind of like a partner with Sammy. So nice. it was just two separate guys, but I, I, I've got a lot of confidence in them and, you know, I've, they're really good and they're amazing. And like, yeah, can something happen? Of course, you know, there's always a risk, right. Of something. And definitely I've thought about it. I've even thought about it mid turn. Like, don't think about that right now. <laughs> you know, like the thought pops in your head and you're like, <laughs> like yeah, there's nothing you can do about that at this point, you know, but yep. yeah, I don't want one of those things going through my canopy or my lines at 300 feet. No, <laughs> right? no, no, no. Just gonna roll out of your turn or something like, no, bad timing. So, well, the, the, the stuff that you guys are able to get the incredible footage that's getting out there and the visuals that people are seeing non-jumpers you know people that aren't in the sport that are for the first time seeing the sport kind of through our eyes because of the drones um are are just giving this incredible footage that's going out to the masses and i'm wondering is is it images like that and some of the the stunts and events that you guys are doing is that giving you access to more and more because i mean i see you doing a lot of urban stuff as well that not that long ago you just didn't see because people get the fuck away from our buildings. No, this shit doesn't happen yeah. here, you know. I mean, so it's got to be giving you better access, no? No, I wouldn't say so. Actually, <laughs> um, no, that right. was just Panama. I mean, we were just recently in Panama, and you know, just different rules in South mm. America, Central sure. America. Sorry, but but also, you know, just like you go south of the border, and it's just different rules. Um, I wouldn't say it's given us more access. I mean, we've been doing things through buildings and doing demos into downtowns and, you know, going tight lines through things like that for, for a long time. I think the images that are coming out are much different now, but sure. I, I don't think it's given us more access. If anything, it's kind of, you know, you gotta be more careful because, you know, you're just, you're always just this close to just getting in trouble because sure. <laughs> everything's sure. being filmed and, you know sometimes you just you know you're pushing the limits of yourself and you, you, you're maybe not thinking 
like you're thinking more survivability, right? You're not thinking like, oh, I got to follow the rules here, right? You're like in the moment, right? Right. I'm not thinking. Like, I'm thinking like instinct kicks in. Right? I'm not sure. Thinking like that. just this instinct of, and the instinct is surviving. It's not like following a a little rule or a technicality in some cases. So I think you know having everything filmed all the time is, if anything, it's it's probably hurting us. And, <laughs> right. And, us, you know, I do think though having these images where it's enabling is just like the next generation, right? It's 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 accelerating the evolution. You know, sure. it's just like the kid that grew up never seeing someone do a three sixty, and he does, and then now they're just watching dudes doing ten eighties all day long. That's like that's normal. They're gonna start doing like the fourteen hundreds. Sure, normal. Sure, it's just that, that evolution of being used to and just just having that in your mind like this is possible sure you know versus it's like, it's a bit of a double-edged you know. a bit of a double-edged sword though right because it it uh, it's showing a lot of guys that uh, guys and girls that might not be ready for that next step uh it's getting them to try and uh maybe push their limits a little too hard to get the cool video yeah i maybe but i think it's always been that that's sure. always been the case relative to that sure there's sure. always been some dude on the dz that's like doing something and like the newbie is like ah that you know like I'm gonna do yeah that. and then so it's it's i think it's kind of it's just it's all relative sure and it's been going on since yeah since i was a student and it always will and it always will now um i see the wedding ring you're a family man um how does that was my right hand actually oh is it this is an aura ring oh i thought yeah, it was a wedding ring <laughs> <laughs> all right there's just like uh there's like some sensors and it measures like all sorts of mainly it's a uh, heart rate um motion and and uh o2 uh um the green light i think it like measures your your o2 saturate your saturation oh. of your all right blood. fair enough <laughs> Whatever. So so, it, just it just tells you how good or bad you slept you know which you enough. probably could just know if you wake up feeling good you probably slept good and if you wake up feeling tired you probably slept pretty tired but um you know i like i like diving into a little bit more of the science behind it and it keeps sure. me accountable you go to sleep earlier but yes i am a family man though i am a family man i'm not a married man but i am a family man uh, my girlfriend has uh three kids at home and I, we live together and yeah, very much. So it's a very real relationship and we've been together for over four years. We nice. hung out in COVID and we like COVID created our relationship. COVID had the <laughs> ultimate test. Before. It was it. It was like, she's like, she's living in New York. I was in Arizona at the time. And she's like, so are you going to quarantine in Arizona? Or are you going to get your butt over here and quarantine with me in New York? And I was like, See you in three days. Well, three days because it was still zombie. Ap I was not getting on an airplane, so I had to drive to New York, you know? Nice. So I was like, yeah, I'll see you in three days. I packed the car, drove, <laughs> threw my dog in the back. I'm like, let's go. We're going. COVID and formed a lot of relationships, man. I had moved in with my girlfriend, um, I want to say, five days before we locked down in Dubai. And in Dubai, we had a proper fucking lockdown. Like, it was close your doors, get a pass from the police to go to the supermarket lockdown uh, wow. for a couple for a couple months. Um, so when we survived that um, and came out the other side still doing pretty good, I'm like, I got to fucking marry this woman because we didn't kill each other. <laughs> so COVID is a part of the reason why I'm married. <laughs> nice. Yeah, man. Dude, that's awesome. Yeah, dude. Yeah, it was it relationships or it. Definitely it, destroyed a lot. Oh, it was such a strange time. And I mean, <laughs> everybody's got their stories, but I remember thinking, fuck, man, I went from, you know, just trying to adjust to living with a new person with work and everything to not being able to leave the house. And I think we were three weeks into the lockdown and I'm standing on my balcony at like 1030 in the morning, drinking a Patron XO cafe in my underwear, talking to, yeah, talking to my Muslim neighbor uh, during uh, Ramadan. And it dawns on me. I'm like, dude, I'm sorry that I'm naked and drinking alcohol in front of you. He's like, I don't fucking care. <laughs> <laughs> weird days, man. Weird days. So- uh 
with everything that's gone on and and all the amazing stuff that I see you putting out, is there any really big things coming up on the horizon? Have you got any uh, any noteworthy stuff? Yeah, I'm not going to the moon or anything that big, but um, I've got a couple cool projects, a couple that are happening soon. I I hate to talk about them, you know, sure. spoil any of them. Um, they involve swooping. I'll tell you that. <laughs> so, one coming up here next month. It's a smaller project, but it's just been a lot of planning. It'll appear on the final side of it. You know, you'll never know the work that one involved for permitting and all this stuff. But um, it's been in the work since before COVID. Oh since wow! Like, yeah, and that one's happening in about a month. And then I have one that's slated for for this year. We don't have dates yet, and been like kind of a two-year project but the first year was really just scouting and, and and doing all the the groundwork and just traveling to all these locations to find find areas and uh so hopefully we're hopefully we're gonna um kick that off in october nice and that'll be that'll be like multiple days that's a bigger bigger project bigger production crew following me around so bigger you, than i was gonna than say anything i've got up to date so, oh wow just and it's just me though that's the thing like it's like my project it's like my project like we've done some pretty big projects as a team sure you know um but so it's it's the level of, of some of those but it's just like the jeff Rowe show sure do you <laughs> do you get that uh uh the hard come down after a big project because i mean so much time goes into some of these projects do you find when it's done you're sitting around just kind of oh it's over no, no, actually, no, I don't really, because, because there's always just something else about to kick off, right? Nice. Like the regular day to day is keeping you busy. I, I don't feel that so much um, or at all after the project. A lot of times I'm just happy it's it's done, you know, sure. because it, it, it gets to a point sometimes, you know, yeah, you're just, you know, you're burning it down on both, both ends to make it happen. And, you know, you're just running at 120%. And, you know, not necessarily the, on the jumping side either, but, you know, the meetings, the emails, this, that, the traveling, you know, all the other logistics of, of, of you know, whatever goes into like creating a project or a special jump, like, but I well, think my big come downs are really just when I, when I can't jump mm. like injuries, injuries are tough. They're Have tough. you dealt with a lot of injuries? A, a handful recently i've dealt with a couple back-to-back -back ones but you know over the grand scheme of things like the amount of years that i've been jumping it's like barely you know a fraction of the time really i've spent injured but uh this last, last year i've i've spent back-to-back uh, -back broken shoulder three months not even really recovered i started jumping just because i was like i gotta jump you know pushing myself and then I uh, had so much focus and attention into my shoulder. I wasn't like warming up any other part of my body. And then on a jump, I detached my hamstring, full oh. detached hamstring. Yeah, Fuck tore me. right off my bones. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that was that was uh, surgically repaired. You know, clamped back onto my tailbone or my sit bones, and you know, just been uh, just been coming back from that. And I'm. You know, it's six months. I've got an amazing team, amazing PT care, like everything, like the team behind me through my recovery. And we just did some testing two days ago here. I'm at Red Bull actually right now at the uh, training facility here. And we did some testing and great news that like my hamstring is like so much better. It's so much stronger, all yada, yada, yada. But it's it's still some work to go to get 100%. So like go to like full sprints, you know, full max, like loading it to the max. So, but sure. I, you know, I'm back to normal shape. Like I feel good, you know, I'm squatting what I was squatting before the injury. So it's kind of like a deceiving injury. Like the come, you know, like I feel good. I feel like I should be good. But then when we, you talk to the, you know, the, the scientists in the lab over there, they're like, you're not quite ready yet. You know, like, <laughs> yeah. You know, they're like, well, you're tending, you know, the stiffness and this and that. like, oh, science dude i i feel for you man i uh, uh back in 2009 i detached my bicep um and oh. it's 
it's a strange feeling. I can't even imagine what it's like for a hamstring, but with the bicep, it was just the weirdest thing. It was a, a very brief, incredibly intense pain. And then the muscle just was doing shit it wasn't designed to do. Didn't hurt anymore. It just was doing some weird Same. stuff. Same. So, I didn't have a lot of pain from, from the hamstring. You know, I didn't even feel it pop. Oof. Um, yeah, I didn't feel any of that, you know, and it was just like my leg just wouldn't work and it was just like weird and I was like, it felt sore, but it wasn't like pain. It wasn't like sharp. It wasn't anything like that. The recovery of it sucked though, you know, getting sure. reattached and being um, bed, you know, just having to be laying flat for three or four weeks was um, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Your leg, it's like everything. It's like, you know, you can't walk, right? You're just like, I can't bend my hip at all. Like I can't raise my knee at all. Like you have to stay straight and lay flat, right? Sure. You know, that was it's like, ah, oh, that was tough. That was yeah, tough. I can imagine. Now, so you said you're at the Red Bull facility. So yeah. what they really take care of their athletes. They really do. Um, I mean, it's, it's, oh, yeah, they really do. I love Red Bull. And I love my Red Bull family. I really do, man. I mean, I've been with them for so long. I mean, the people here are just amazing. They really, it's an amazing company, the core at the core. And it just, just, that just shows like, sure. Uh, well, you know, it's, you need, it, good, leadership. You need it, good leadership, you know, and good vision and vision. Sure. And, and they have, they have that. You know? Well, it's the ultimate marketing I've ever seen because, well, the funny thing is, of course, especially coming from the sport, when I think Red Bull, one of the last things I think of is the drink. I All I think <laughs> of is all the amazing sport shit that they sponsor. The race. A lot of people, I get that. I hear that a lot when I talk to people about it, you know, especially from the outside. It's like that's you hear that a lot. Yeah. It's, it's literally, yeah, it's, hey, not alone. it's, they sponsor all these things and they do F1 and they do skydiving and they do base jumping and this and that and the other thing. Oh, and they make a drink too. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. Have you tried it? <laughs> yeah. Right. I know. Yeah. I mean, the can is still the king here, you know, can is number one. Like this is yep. the Holy grail. And, but really the athletes are kind of like second. It's like, in the world of Rebel, it's like, what's the most important? It's like, this can is the yep. most important thing, number one. What's the second most important? I, I mean, and I might be wrong, but it really feels like the, us, the athletes, are next in line. We're like, That's well, so the can, epic. it wouldn't exist without the can. So, like, of course, the can's number one. You guys are number two. That's and, which is. It's awesome. incredible. Well, they yeah, so Red, Red Bull actually sponsored a, uh, an event that we did at uh, Cross Keys in 2005. We were going for the most yeah. tandems. Yeah. So we did that. We did, I think, 406 tandems in a day. Red Bull threw this massive party. They uh, cooked us all dinner and everything. But, of course, we jumped from sunrise until like 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And we were turning so fast that the only thing you had time for was either water or Red Bull oh, and a couple of Snickers bars. So by the end of the day, half of us idiots that only drank Red Bull and didn't drink any water throughout the day were dying. I couldn't even eat the dinner because I'd had so much Red Bull. I was just caffeined out of my mind. But then they threw this <laughs> massive party. They had uh, waitresses dressed as pilots and DJs. And oh, it was fucking spectacular, man. Yeah, they're known for that. I mean, yeah. the, the event they put on, it's, I mean, that's definitely, you know, they're known for the sport, the, you know, the amazing wingsuit flights or the biggest, you know, motorcycle back, whatever. And then they're, you know, they're also known for that, I think. Sure. Which is, is, yeah. I mean, honestly, as, as far as branding goes, I don't see that it gets any better. Yeah, they really wrote the book. I think they've, you know, so many companies emulate them and, you know, you know, and now I think, I think it's become, you know, it's a different game again, right? Like marketing is like, they kind of did raise that bar and it was a, a bunch of years where it was just like, oh, right, we got to do it like these guys. And now it's a game change. And it's interesting to see how they're navigating now because it's like, okay, like 
everybody's marketing like savvy and coming up like all these companies are doing things you know, like outside the box that wouldn't have been done 20 years ago but it's sure. interesting to see how red bull's like just like okay we gotta we gotta, we gotta keep doing this somehow. of course well and it's it's nice to see uh fun marketing anyway i mean you're with nz aerosports and nz aerosports has had the best fucking uh tagline ever fuck yeah, yeah. You know, which I am a huge proponent of, man. Even before I had ever touched an NZ Aerosports canopy, the fuck yeah had me by the balls. I just absolutely loved it. So it's just, again, wonderful marketing. And then, as you would know, dealing with the NZ people, it's such a cool crew of people over there. It's like a little, you know, mini version of something like Red Bull. It's it's this family-oriented, badass little crew that's kind of doing their own thing. Oh, and they also have an incredible product. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. So what comes next for you? Um, uh, like, uh, I know you said you've got a bunch of events, but long term, do you see yourself doing this until you're old and gray? Man, that's a good question, you know, and it goes through my mind a lot these days, especially coming off of two injuries. I'm 46, you know, and just trying to, like, power through that and, uh you know, it's definitely, this year has been an interesting year for me because laying flat and just immobilized for a while kind of just put things into perspective. Sure. And I think the hardest thing for me to swallow was, you know, my days are numbered. I'm closer sure. to the end than I am the beginning. Sure. At this level, I mean, yeah, can you skydive till the day you get old and die? Yeah, yeah, we all know some 70-year-old something at the drop. Like, we all see that. And for sure, is it always... Yes, it's always going to be part of me. I feel like I'm part of this fam this Sky family for the rest of my life. Sure. Um, but at this level, you know, it's it's uh, yeah, it's definitely um, that's that, and that's why I'm putting in the time here. You know, and I put in the time, and that's why I've, I've put, you know, what am I doing outside of the sport to better myself in within the sport? You know, and you just got to train differently. You have to be way more mindful the older you get in the sport, you know, for longevity, you know, sure. even if you're not having a bad crash and play it safe, man, there's so many, you know, the overuse injuries, like everybody feels it. Like you go to the drop zone and every jumper out there is going to complain about, Oh man, my neck, my this, my that, 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 you know? And you know what I find is very few, very few skydivers are doing much um, on the back end for it. You know, sure. just kind of like seeing at the bar at the end of the day. And it's like, uh, you know, it's like, well, feel like, you know, you can feel like that and just feel like that, and, you know, or, or you can change something. Sure. So you can change something and then you could also maybe gain a few more years at the end, right? At at a higher level. At peak so level, yeah. Have I, have I peaked out? Like maybe in some things I have, you know, but in some other aspects, I feel like I'm still a little bit on that trajectory. Sure. I haven't kind of relaxed over yet, yeah. You know? But it's 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 happening. Like I'm in those years right now, and but it's it's a tough one to swallow, and it's not easy to accept that. But at the same time, I think there's like a great like rewarding side on 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 that end too. Sure. Of of kind of you know once I can just be at ease with that and cool with that, like kind of being on that other side of of like shit like look at this amazing career i had right and 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 still being involved in it but on in a different way and kind of like kind of going into more of that like oh like it's i don't want to say the word legend status you know but like you know you're like well legends it, it is like legends to me are like yeah like people who are like dead or legends right you know like right you say a living legend right it's like we have to differ like a living legend from a legend right sure so, but like being into that next category like that's kind of cool and exciting too you know of well yeah, it's making it, it's it's better. it's yeah, it's know. It's leaving your mark and knowing that you had a positive uh effect on the sport that we fucking love yeah and that's what it is really yeah. you know that's i really mean what it is leaving a mark like everybody wants to not you know you don't want to be forgotten sure you, know? you want something to like live on from you so yeah hopefully you know you just made a big enough impact that you know 
Well, Before and we... I mean, it, it, it's a good tip to the young guys that are coming up to take extra special care of yourself. The young guys and gals coming up that are, you know, really take exceptional care of yourself outside of jumping. Uh, I've told the story quite a few times on the podcast of walking across the packing mat at uh, Scott of Arizona and seeing Sean McCormick leading a group of up jumpers doing yoga and thinking, oh, pff, the fuck are they doing? And now all these years later, all I can think is, I wish I'd have put my ass on that mat and done yoga with Sean McCormick. <laughs> <laughs> you know yeah yeah you know it's it's but you got to understand right we we were there we were, we, we you got to understand the evolution of the culture right? sure of the sport too. and yeah no i mean in the beginning it wasn't that like it was jump and then drink yeah you know? it was like yep. beer lights on you know and you know beer light still goes on and there's nothing wrong with that but well, we yeah. were kind of the crash test dummy generation, you know, for modern skydiving, and we definitely did our jobs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I remember first times that, like, guys were, especially Red Bull kind of referred to us as athletes, you know, and, and, and like, inside the, you know, inside the our team or in the community, it would just be, like, you know, almost, like, chuckling at it. Like, oh, you're an athlete, dude. Like, you know, like. Right it was it was like you didn't consider yourself an athlete even a com as a com competitor in the sport you know I, it was like this like little weird disconnect of like sure we're not really at you know it's like eh, this is just kind of for fun you know like we're just having a good time right you know it wasn't like taken to this like, even if you were competing and all that stuff it just sure. didn't feel that way well, I mean, yeah. the the events and the culture that surrounded it were such a party atmosphere, and, and it was so damn much fun. It's tough to think of yourself as an athlete when you know at the end of the day it's going to end up with God knows how many drinks and partying all night long and all that stuff. So it's I can understand the disconnect for sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that's kind of – that's changing. I think the culture has changed a lot in the sport. Sure. And we're, you know – there's still parties at drop zones and all that stuff, but I, it, it feels different somehow to me now. Like the whole it feels sport. more responsible to me. Yeah, it does. It does. And, you know, even, even, you know, the level of knowledge is kind of stepped. I remember like nobody could teach us how to land a parachute. I was, learning how to fly. I was like, all right, you know, just flare. Yeah. You know, and we were figuring out the rear risers and, you know, figuring out all that stuff. No one was teaching that to us. It was like, it was like kind of like we were in that right age and point in the sport where we were like kind of evolving with the sport. Sure. Kind of riding the edge of that wave of, of evolution. Sure. Technology was changing. The techniques were kind of evolving. And it was, it was, you know, when you were at that forefront of it, of like figuring out how to free fly or use the rear risers as a landing to, you know, I was like, you land with those things, you know, like, oh, I remember the day where it was like, I'm going to start playing with the rear risers. Don't really know what I'm doing here. Sure. Couldn't really talk to anybody. Even if you talk to someone who was like, you know, one of the other factory team guys, like on a canopy, one of the other canopy guys, it was like, they couldn't give you much information. They were like, give you a little bit of their experience, but, oh, this is what I've been doing. And <laughs> yeah, but it wasn't so like, is how you do it for sure well I, I like you i i i felt very lucky that i kind of came up in what i felt was like the next evolution of skydiving you know bill booth and that crew being the one before us and then as the the canopy started to evolve and it started to transition into a lot more high performance and stuff we kind of had to figure it out as we were going you know it, it yeah. was it, and it was it was a really fucking cool time. And, and not to say that now isn't an amazing time as well, because again, this progression is just insane with technology. But I think this generation that's coming up now is tapping on what we had to figure out from scratch. And they've got all of us, I should say, I say us, but what I mean is you guys. <laughs> they've got you guys to follow. Oh, yeah. Yeah. In in that evolution of of not just body flight but canopy piloting because of the groundbreaking stuff that our generation learned. Yeah, yeah, it's you know when the, the it, there was a big gap that was like when the 
now I feel like the technique is definitely more advanced than the the, the equipment. Mm. You know what I mean? Where like where there was a time when those tri brace parachutes came out, cross brace parachutes, sorry. Um, you know, and the FX came out where people were flying them like toggle monkey stiletto pilots. Like yep. they weren't flying them like the way that like they there wasn't the 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 skill and the the knowledge sure. of how to buy them yet. So we had these these wings that were way more advanced than the actual technique at that point. Sure. And then that kind of caught up. And now I feel like, okay, you know, the level, like, I think it's a little bit more tip the other way now, even. I'd agree with you. I mean, I, I watch videos from, uh, you know, four or five, six years ago, maybe a little longer when the cross brace stuff really started to take off. And I watched the flying from then and the flying now and the, the pilots that are truly on top of their game, appear to me to be ready for the next evolution yeah 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 they are they're you know they're they're the techniques are they're milking everything they can out of these wings everything where in the beginning it was like we weren't even, weren't even close yet they weren't even close when those wings first came out it was like yeah we don't we're not even close to to doing what you know swooping is efficiently oh, yeah as as we could you know oh the the long swoops that i'm seeing now i'm watching these canopies that are literally fading off into the distance out of camera and barely in focus anymore and they're just going and going and going and it it, it blows me away because of course I, just like you i was around when the stiletto was the greatest canopy that had ever been made and everybody was you know toggle whipping the shit out of them and from that to this in a relatively short period of time is incredible yeah yeah it really is yeah no it is so as, as we wrap things up i generally ask people um to give a bit of advice especially for newer jumpers coming up as a guy that's been with red bull for a long long time and been at the top of your particular game for a long long time what advice do you have to somebody that's just getting started out and wants to be you in five or 10 years, what do they need to be focusing on? You know, wear earplugs. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Save your, save your hearing. Um, <laughs> yeah. I know I mean, people, people, because the culture is changing and you have, you know, guys just watching the stuff online and then they just go to the drop zone and they're not really like investing the time as we did as like full-time skydive bums. I think, I think the people who excel are the people who have mentors, you know, mm. the ones that are putting in that, that full, that extra time into it, you know, and anybody like, yeah, we got, you know, the weekend warrior, it's, it's hard. You got your job, you got your life, you got your family, you got maybe one or two days a week to get out to the drop zone, but you know, you really need to, it, it doesn't just happen in the plane and on the packing mat and in the air. Like it really does happen at, off the drop zone you know, continuing to spend time with, you know, other jumpers. And, you know, that's really where all the real learning, I think, be, takes place. Um, the core learning is just, is it, it's it's kind of sometimes off off the field. Sure. Right? Um, or a lot of times off the field. And, you know, just trying to connect with with jumpers and, and, and finding a mentor, you know. Sure. I was very like I moved to the drop zone, like I said, I moved to Skydive Arizona right out of school, like surrounded by world champions that like, you know, airspeed and, and Arizona free flight, the free flight team out there at the time, Omar and Tim and Curtis. And I mean, they were like, you know, warm, welcome, you know. And yep. I had a I had world champions looking out after me. I had like, you know, a couple hundred jumps. You know, and then if I wasn't jumping, I'd be watching them landing and, you know, sitting there just watching and, you know, spending all that extra time there. And then, you know, going out and traveling, whatever, going to Phoenix with, with, the, with someone, you know, and just being together and learning, you know, more just, you know, just about everything, you know, sure. just trying to absorb all. You can't just, you know, show up you know, get your five minute brief and then, you know, be okay, cool. Yeah. You're never going to get, you, know, you might get the skills, you know, you might acquire good skills and, 
shred and be like this amazing tunnel flyer and all that. But in skydiving, you know, it's not just about the skill. It's so much more about like the knowledge and, and just, uh, the experience, like building experience and experience goes way farther in the sport. I think than skill, you know, skill will get you into trouble because that without the experience, you're going to put yourself in bad situations and skill ain't always going to get you out, but experience will. Absolutely. Skill skill will give you like a false perception sometimes of like, okay, I'm really good. You know? And, but yeah, you, you've got to have that experience to draw on. I mean, if you don't have that, again, like you just said, you're going to end up putting yourself in the corner. Yeah, so that wasn't like a real simple short answer to your like question. I, I would say like, you know, find a mentor. Find you a know? mentor. And use mentor. earplugs, man. That that fucking, yeah. that that's a sincere laugh as I sit here with headphones on and tinnitus fucking ringing in my ears. There's a cure <laughs> for it now, though. I just read about it. Yeah. Please. Um, Tell me and anybody else listening, what? What was it? Um, it's something really bizarre, too. It's like, eat this. Oh, like, dude. Herb or something. I, I forget what it is, but I just read about it, that there's like this breakthrough in some cure for it. So. If you remember between fucking 12,000 jumps of free fall and 10,000 hours of two and otter flying, I've got enough fucking ringing in my ears. Oh, man please I, like, I, i'm pretty sure you could just start googling it and it's out there i don't know Oof. where I read it, if it was on the gram like like follow some of those pages like popular mechanics sure all there's those, like science uh i can't think of all the names of them now but it must have been on the gram it must have been one of those those groups or maybe it was like huberman sure podcast or one of those like you know Man, oh man, there's uh there's next to nothing I wouldn't eat to get rid of the ringing in my ears. <laughs> yeah, there's something crazy though. I just read about it and I was like, oh wow, that's crazy. They just there's a cure for that. All right, I'm gonna have to check that out. Now, as we wrap up, I want you to give everybody all the ways to follow you and to follow Red Bull. Give me all the social uh details and everything. Yeah, so me, um mainly Instagram, just Jeff Provenzano. Red Bull Air Force on Instagram. Also, obviously, Red Bull, uh, the big channel, the mother channel of it all on any platform, TV, <laughs> Rebel TV, Rebel everything, you know, Instagram, TikTok, you name it. Um, but that's it. Yeah. Nice. Jeff, I cannot thank you enough. I've been waiting for this forever, and it was exactly what I was hoping, man. It's been fantastic talking to you. I'm, I'm, I'm glad we finally got to catch up. Sorry it took this long. No, no, man. Like I, I knew I'd enjoy talking and chatting. I always do. Like so. I said pre-podcast, man, when it comes to skydivers, time is irrelevant, and I know that. <laughs> right on. Take care, brother. Thank you. See ya. Well, there you have it. Another episode of the Lunatic Fringe Podcast brought to you as always by, well, wait, not as always, actually. Brought to you now by Gyro. Formerly known as NZ Aerosports, you'll head to gyro.com for their next level line of canopies. By Pussfoot, the Extreme Sports Collective. Head over to pussfoot.com to check it out. By Summit Parachute Systems, Check out SummitParachuteSystems.com to talk to Jarrett Martin and the gang about kick-ass pilot rigs, rigging courses, and more. By Flyaway Indoor Skydiving. Go to FlyawayTN.com and check out all the cutting-edge stuff to come. By Pure Spectrum CBD. Head to PureSpectrumCBD.com to check out their wide range of CBD products. And as for us, head to the LunaticFringePodcast.com to listen to any of the hundreds of episodes currently available. Hit the link for our YouTube channel, pick up your copy of the Lunatic Fringe book or The Accidental Stripper, and get a sneak peek at upcoming guests. Once again, thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.